Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to the sixth of our solar eclipse planning seminars uh, sessions. Uh, tonight, we have as, as the main event, George Doshek, who's going to be talking to you about, uh, to us, about um, some of the physics that underlays what creates the solar corona, which is the main topic of interest when we go to a total, total solar eclipse, because it's something that can't be seen uh, from Earth, naked eye, without uh, at any other time. And that's that's a big draw for uh, traveling around the world to go to total, total solar eclipses. Uh, I'll start sharing, uh, have a couple of slides and then uh, introducing George and then we'll go right into his talk and he's going to uh, to lead that one from his location. So, So let's talk about the agenda for tonight. Uh, I, I don't myself have anything uh, as far as announcements, but uh, we'll, we'll leave some time for anybody who has something they want to contribute to the group. Uh, then we've got George, who's going to be talking about the solar physics of creation of the uh, uh, prominences and other structure on the, around the sun and the the corona, the inner and outer corona. Um, if there's any time, we'll talk a little bit about exposure times that those lead to. Uh, that may be something we put in abeyance for a future discussion, but I wanna tie uh, the the physics of the corona into what we see and, and what it means or how we observe the, the total solar eclipse. Uh, we'll talk about a schedule for the suggestion which people made and liked about having a hands-on session uh, soon where people can just bring their proposed photography setup or visual setup if they'd like and just do a run a run through with the regular sun uh, a non-eclipse day and just practice it and see if you really have all the equipment that you think you might need and if you're missing anything have plenty of time to buy what you need either you want to get a better mount or make sure you have all the right cables or uh, the right kind of optics to feed your camera. Um, and then we can also talk about other future sessions. So with that, we'll go into an introduction to George. Uh, he didn't give me a formal title. This is my version of what I think he's gonna be talking about. And I just wanna give you uh, people probably know George from Novak, but a little bit more of the formality of his background. Uh, most recently, he's been very active in being the person who makes arrangements for almost all of the speakers we have at the uh, at the Novak meetings. He's been doing that for quite a few years, and he's been a leader in the club even before that, helping out in various ways, being a member of the board. Uh, he received his PhD from University of Pittsburgh in 1968. And my understanding from, from people who went to school in Pittsburgh around that time, that maybe he ended up in solar physics because uh, that was the only astronomical object you could see from Pittsburgh in those days. Um, it was pretty bad with the steel mills. Now it's cleaned up. Um, he did a, a postdoc, I believe, with the NRL immediately following his graduation. And he stayed there ever since um, as a member of the staff uh, ending up in the solar and heliospheric physics branch. Uh, he was chairman of the solar physics division of the American Astronomical Society for two years. Uh, and he was a recipient in 2015 of the um, SPD's most prestigious award, the George Ellery Hale Prize for his, uh, his work in, in solar spectroscopy. Uh, and I need to caveat that by saying most of his spectroscopy was a non-visible wavelengths, very high energy uh, phenomenon, which he'll talk about in his talk. Uh, and he's been doing those observations because the UV doesn't come through the atmosphere. Many of his observations are based on space-based sensors, which he developed. Uh, George is not just a tie and jacket guy, but he also likes to have a good time in the traditional naval in the Navy tradition, 
of everything goes better with uh, something to drink stronger than the coffee they serve on the subs. So with that, uh, I'll let George take over and uh, he's going to drive his his slides and uh, he'll tell you about the sun. George. OK, so the we talk I'm going to give, I've given a couple of talks to uh, Novak. I gave an astronomy day talk and I've given two talks at Almost Heaven Star Party. In fact, Alan got me to give one on the eclipse in 2017. So you know, that's forming the basis of what I'm going to uh, talk here about. As Alan said, um, I started out, at basic, uh, basically I've only done space-based uh, astronomy or solar physics. Uh, I started out in X-ray astronomy, in fact, and getting spectra in the X-ray region of the sun around two angstroms and stuff like that. So, But that's the only way to learn about um, the really energetic stuff in the sun. You want to like flares that make x-rays and particles, accelerated particles and stuff like that. You've got to observe in the extreme ultraviolet and x-ray region. Okay, so let me review a few things. <clears throat> Most of you know that the sun's a big, a big uh, ball of, of hot gas and has a core. And in the core, uh, hydrogen is being converted into helium. And this provides the outward pressure which keeps the, the sun from collapsing. Uh, energy that's created, that when you convert hydrogen to helium, the mass of the four hydrogen atoms that are used is less than the mass of the helium atom, and that mass is converted into energy which radiates outward. So it starts out, it goes through a radiated zone when the density is still high, but eventually the density drops so much that the sun starts to boil, and you have a convective zone. And the convective zone goes to the surface, which, as you know, is called the photosphere. And then all the other stuff, the solar flares and the mass ejections occur above uh, the atmosphere. So I want to focus kind of on what you'll be seeing. And, and I'll also show you what you don't see. You see, you, you look at a lot of these ultraviolet images, extreme ultraviolet images, every time uh, someone talks about the sun. And you may wonder, well, if I can't see them, what produces them? So I want to talk a little bit about that too. Um, okay, so it's just a little slide to show what fusion is all about for people that um, have not uh, studied much about the sun. The outer layers of the sun just tend to crush the ball, the cores, of, and the fusion is what makes the energy that pushes outward and maintains the sun. When the sun finishes burning its hydrogen, converting its core into mostly helium, the helium will be at a too low a temperature, which is it's still a very high temperature, it's like 15 million degrees, but it won't be able to fuse to make heavier elements. It will have to collapse. When it does so, it will produce a, high, a hydrogen burning skin around here, and the outer layers of the sun will expand, and the sun will become a red giant. And this will go on, and this will cause the core, the core will collapse more and eventually start fusing helium into carbon and oxygen to making these heavy elements. Uh, this will eventually stop and the sun will become a white dwarf. And I, I'm not going to talk more about that, except to say that all the elements that we're made of are made in stars. So heavier stars in the sun will continue this fusion reaction and convert carbon and oxygen and neon, magnesium, aluminum, sulfur, and all these elements all the way up to iron. When you get up to iron, iron can't fuse. I mean, you can fuse, but you have to put energy in to make it fuse, and that's not what you want. You want, you want fusion to make put energy outward. So the core will collapse into a neutron star, or maybe a black hole will be a big supernova. When the supernova occurs, all the elements heavier than iron, the ones that are not abundant at all, like bismuth, iron, um, iodine, uh, uranium, and stuff like that, gold, platinum, those things will be made in a flash. And so that's how all the elements are made. And you can go look at M101 and see the supernova and see one of those events occurring. Okay, what happens when you get to the surface of the sun? <clears throat> the surface of the sun is complex. And why is it complex? It's because the sun actually rotates differentially and creates a magnetic field. I'll show you examples in a minute of that. And as a result of that, you have this huge magnetic field and the density is so low up there that the magnetic field controls the plasma. 
the plasma gets confined in field lines and the field determines what you're going to see. Uh, I don't know, I got this graph in some paper somebody published and there's something called a flectosphere. I don't know what a flectosphere is. <laughs> it's just jargon, I have no idea. But within this thing, which you have very small structures and very large structures, and all of it contains plasma or, or gas, which emits radiation that you can see in the extreme ultraviolet or X-ray region. Okay, so here's sort of like what you're gonna see in the eclipse. You all know you can see a white light sun, which is about 58 degrees Kelvin. And if you look in higher resolution, you would see these little things called granules, which I think if you have a really good um, APO telescope, like something like a four inch refractor, I think you, and you've got good seeing, you can see some of these granules. Very, very small things. It's like the, the final thing that happens in the sun is the sun boils. It's like a pot of water. And this boiling motion can be seen. And then you have the sunspots, which I'll say a little more about, where you have an umbra and you have an outer region where plasma is flowing out from the sunspot called a penumbra. Then as you go to higher temperatures, you go up to 100,000 degrees in the extreme ultraviolet, you, it looks entirely different. You see structures but you don't see these particular sunspots very bright. You see bright regions, the active regions that are caused by gas that gets heated up to 100,000 degrees are very bright and it's dense and you see it. And if you continue to look and go to higher temperatures like one, six million degrees, you're gonna get structures that go into the corona and they're, they're very amorphous. They get more amorphous as you go to higher temperatures and like a, like a painting where you're smearing everything out. And finally, if you go to 2 million degrees, you get you run into the solar wind, which is plasma and the corona blowing outward. And you see this, this image here, which is mostly in white light. You don't see the X-rays and EV visually to your eye. You will see a white light corona. And that's because of uh, electrons in the corona will scatter the light from the solar disk, which is represented by this little circle down here. And so that's, you will, you will see this, but you can't see this easily without a, a total solar eclipse because the radiation is diffracted. You can't go down to the surface of the sun. So if you want to image the corona in space with an instrument, you need to occult the sun a bit so that it doesn't just send so much visible light into the instrument that you can't see the corona at all. Okay, so to make this a little clearer, Here's the white light sun. And because of the magnetic field on the sun, it's especially strong around sunspots, you get field lines, which when you extrapolate these field lines, go up into the corona. The, the white and black are simply the polarities of the, of the magnetic field, North Pole and South Pole. And you, this is all with the field that's along the line of sight. The field transverse to the line of sight is much harder to see. We can see it, but it takes special instruments to see that. But if you extrapolate these magnetic fields into the corona, this is what you see. And as a result of that, you will see something like this visually when the total solar eclipse occurs. You will see the magnetic field and you will see these like striations in it, which are formed these, these loops that are, that are from the magnetic field lines that are trapping plasma inside the loops. Okay, well, how is this field formed? Uh, it seemed to be complex. The sun rotates differentially. It rotates faster at the equator than at the poles. So, and it, there is a, a poroidal magnetic field, like a bar magnet that comes around here and stretches and goes up here. So what happens in a magnetic flux line that's from a poroidal field line from the differential rotation starts to deform it? and starts to convert it into a poroidal field. So you have a poroidal field this way, and you'll have a poroidal field, uh, poroidal field this way and a toroidal field this way, like a torus. And as a result of this, the field lines get jumbled up and form loop-like structures. And here's another example of it, the poroidal field lines. 
and they get stretched out because of differential rotation in the toroidal fields. And you get these loops and these loops pop through the surface and you get these flux loops that you see in pictures of the sun or images of the sun that you find on NASA sites and stuff like that when they talk about flares. You get things like this. So these are images of the sun taken in the extreme ultraviolet. You can't see these, but the plasma is trapped in them. The plasma is trapped in them because the magnetic field is a funny force. It's difficult to oppose this force by flowing against the field lines. If you have gas that wants to flow this way, it tends to remain trapped where it is. But if, if the gas wants to flow this way, it can do it very easily. There's no magnetic force on it at all. But it's, uh, so if you can look this up in Google, talk about the force of a magnetic field and you'll, you'll see how it works. It's rather complicated. At any rate, the field, these are fields. So you say, what are these? What is it causing this emission? What's producing the emission? So here's another example very nice from an early, uh, this is one of the first spacecraft to be able to take normal incidence pictures of the sun and the extreme ultraviolet who will not use grazing incidents. And this is done by coating the mirror surfaces with a multi-layer coating of like silicon and molybdenum, a heavy element and a light element. And this thing acts like an interference filter and creates uh, constructive and destructive interference. And because of that, over limited wavelength band, a mirror can reflect extreme ultraviolet light. It doesn't reflect 90% or 99% like aluminum coatings and on our dielectrics and stuff that we use in optical stuff, but it'll it'll make up to like 25% reflectivity at, at a certain wavelength and it'll die out on either side of it for about maybe the hundreds or so angstroms. So that's how all these images are taken. But what makes the images? Uh, okay, we observe mostly invisible light. We, we can't observe infrared. We can't go up here and the, the, where the web is and look at stuff like that. Uh, and then when you go to the short wavelengths, you get to the X-rays and ultraviolet and the gamma rays. And what happens in the corona? Corona is hot. The corona is about a million degrees. The atoms get stripped of their electrons. So around the normal atom, you have a certain number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. The number of protons, is a, these are positively charged and neutrons are negatively, uh, don't have any charge. And the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons around the atom, which are negatively charged, so that the atom is neutral. But when the temperature, when, the, when these atoms are in a gas and the temperature starts to get higher, Electrons that get knocked off start to knock off the outer electrons of these atoms. And then an atom may lose several electrons, and now it's no longer a neutral atom. It's a charged atom, and they're called ions. So within the atom itself, because of quantum mechanics, the electrons are bound to certain discrete energy levels. You can't, be, you can't have an electron rotating around an atom in any old position or any old place. It's, the electron is actually like a cloud that can only occupy certain areas of the, of the atom. So in a sense, these electrons are like the notes of a piano, where a piano only produces certain frequencies of sound, so you only get certain frequencies of light out of ions. So if Electrons, three electrons come along, they can excite these electrons and kick them up to higher states in the atom, of other energy levels that are allowed. But then the electrons that are bound will come back down to wherever they are and produce discrete emissions of light. So that when you look at wavelengths, uh, you'll see something like this. You have wavelength and you see all these intensity increases that are the discrete emissions of ions that are in the plasma. By the way, the gas called the plasma, even though it's whatever. So just so you know, um, so to review this, ions where atoms of one or more electrons are moved, they're positively charged. So, and we call them H1 is neutral hydrogen, H2 is hydrogen with one electron removed. So in the when we look at uh, 
H alpha radiation in our telescopes, we're looking at lethal hydrogen. But when you go to, to say, go to a nebula in outer space, say the, I don't know, the dumbbell nebula, um, there the gas is pretty hot. It's like 10,000 degrees, and a lot of these atoms of oxygen and carbon have electrons removed. So O3 is, is an ion with two missing electrons. So in fact, in planetary nebula, the only emission in the visible that you can see is from transitions between discrete energy levels in oxygen three. That's why you buy an O3 filter. Because when you put it on, uh, the nothing else is there. It just, it just cancels out all the other light so you can see the emission that you can see visibly. So as, as you heat the gas, more and more electrons from an atom get lost. So what we call, as we say, an isoelectronic sequence is a sequence of ions of the same number of electrons. So for example, when you go to iron and you take all the electrons away but two, it's like helium. Helium has only two electrons, so we call it helium-like iron. And so there are a whole bunch of these isoelectronic sequences. And all these ions have discrete energy levels and emit different frequencies. They're like pianos all tuned in different, way, in different ways. And every time you remove another electron, the tuning gets all different. So the solar spectrum is filled with lines, spectral lines, from all kinds, all over it. Many of them have been now identified, but there are many lines in the solar spectrum that are still not identified. So you see some here, like iron 12 is emitted by gas in a plasma at 1.2 million degrees. This is emitted in the corona of the sun. And this dotted line indicates what telescopes see that don't, that aren't spectrometers. They just see, they have these coatings I've discussed, uh, multi-layer coatings, and they see a bandwidth. And this one is centered, it tries to be centered around this line because it's strong. And it sees all these lines merged together. And that's fine, and, but that's not necessarily the temperature of the plasma you're looking at because if a solar flare occurs, you'll get very strong emission from iron 24, which is iron with only three electrons. It's lithium-like. And it will dominate this iron 12 line completely. And then you'll be looking at plasma at 20 million degrees, not 1.2 million degrees. Okay, here's an example of this. What I've got here is images. There's, there are spectrometers that can image just one spectral line. They don't have to image the whole band. And that's the kind of spectrometer I worked on at NRL and helped develop. And this is, so I'll show you images now in discrete spectral lines formed by ions at different temperatures. And I'm gonna go from low temperatures to high temperatures in an active region. And this is what you see. I hope. Come on. <laughs> this works. This works all the time. It's got to work. Well, it's not working. <laughs> but if it did work, you would see going from helium-2 up to iron-15, what this active region looks like. And it would change. It would look quite different. And in the end, everything would be right up in here. And this, up in this region here, which is very hot, and that's, that's what you would see in the extreme ultraviolet. So we get the temperature distribution in the active region by looking at different spectral lines formed at different temperatures. I thought that plays, but it doesn't. This one plays. Here's another imaging spectrometer, a Lockheed's form, at silicon-4, which is formed at 65,000 degrees. And you see these tiny little structures that change all the way across. They're little loops, tiny little loops attached to magnetic field lines. Okay, now what about the sunspots themselves? The sunspots are formed by strong magnetic fields, a few thousand gauss, but they inhibit heating from within them. They're cooler than the surface by about 2000 degrees. What happens is that the, sun, the heat flowing out from the core of the sun, when it gets to the magnetic fields, can't flow through them very easily. So it gets thrown in around them. So you get this penumbra, but you get a cooler area of the sun. If you took this area of the sun out into space, it would be bright. 
because it's only 2,000 degrees cooler than the surface. So when you have many of these things, the fuel lines are very strong, several thousand counts. And when you get a lot of these, you call this thing a, an active region. This is where all the disturbances in the sun occur that make up space weather. So, and we call this disturbance an active region. It's a source of flares and thermal mass ejections. So when you, we have also, of course, a solar cycle a solar cycle with the magnetic fields. And what happens in a new cycle, sunspots, so you, say you're at solar minimum, there aren't many sunspots. And then a new cycle starts, the sunspots start appearing at high latitudes and they migrate down towards the equator as they appear and you get this butterfly effect. And the magnetic fields are now the, this combination of toroidal and toroidal fields. Uh, you'll get the northern hemisphere of the sun may have positive polarity emerging first, and then the, the following spot will be negative, but in the southern hemisphere, it will be reversed. And as the cycle proceeds, and you get more and more sunspots, they approach the equator like this. And so you get the so-called butterfly diagram. Uh, now, we, the sunspot cycle has been mapped for a long time, and it's been extrapolated. I'll show you something in the next slide. Way back in, in, in for many years, the biggest cycle I know of is in 1960, when I graduated from high school. Um, I don't think it was because I graduated from high school, but there it is. That's the biggest one that we know of. Then we have slightly smaller ones, and then we have some pretty big ones, and then they died out. And uh, beyond here, around 2009, and so we got a very, very deep solar minimum. And some people thought that sunspot cycle wasn't ever going to return. Because back in 1650, there was an area of time called the modern minimum when there were no spots seen. But this is sort of the record that we get of what the sunspot cycle was like over a number of years. And it's, it's variable. It's kind of hard to predict what it's going to be. Where are we now? Because that's what concerns people most. We're here. This is a prediction of the cycle for 2024 and beyond. And this is what we see so far. So. The, we're now seeing more spots than predicted, and that's good. So this may be a, a much larger maximum. When the eclipse occurs, we'll be here. And so we'll be close to the predicted maximum, and probably maybe it'll be even greater. So, so we'll be near solar max. Uh, that will mean something. I'll show you what the corona will look like in a minute. But solar max is different from solar min because there are many more eruptions and flares and active regions and coronal mass ejections produced. And if you look at the x-rays, this is an x-ray telescope. This working O of wavelengths less than 100 angstroms, and it's a grazing incidence telescope. It, it doesn't work like a normal incidence one at all. Um, and, but as you go to, towards solar minimum, it's worked for a very long time. The sun gets very bright and it gets in there very faint when you get into solar minimum. And here's the flux of X rays going down as you approach solar minimum. So, what changes the field? And in addition to the sunspots migrating down towards the equator, the, the blue and the yellow are simply positive and negative fields. There is a flow of materials towards the poles of the sun called the meridional flow. And this generates the next cycles. It's, it puts magnetic fields up there, and then the fields that emerge start to form the next cycle, and the polarities change. So in this cycle going down, the poles here are, say, positive. I don't know if this is positive or negative, or what's positive. And then it changes to negative when you go through solar minimum, and then it goes back up to, to, to positive again um, in about 20 years. So there is a part of the solar cycle is there's an 11 year cycle between maxima and minimum, but there's also a 20 year cycle where you go from say one polarity at the pole to the same polarity later. So that's the entire cycle, sort of. It's a 20 year cycle in one way, but the number of sunspots is based on a, an 11 year cycle. So our solar maximum, what we're gonna see is mostly 
sunspots and stuff all over the sun. Uh, it'll be kind of spherically symmetric. But so at minimum, you get something which is more stretched in the equatorial regions like this. So what we expect to see is something more like this. And it'll be white light because all you're seeing is a scattering of white light from the surface of the sun. You won't see any of this ultraviolet radiation or anything, the emission lines are suspected. But that's okay. I mean, it's nice to have something to really see. Okay, to give you an idea, the sun is dynamic. It, it, it's not sitting there. I just showed you images. The sun is constantly moving. If you look at these little granules at the surface, like boiling water, don't tell me that's the only one that's going to play. Ah, there we go. So the granules just sort of boil. And then when you go out to the corona, there are all sorts of, there are flares occurring and there are coronal mass ejections occurring, which is an emission of gas that's very hot and that's just flowing outward. I don't think we'll see a coronal mass ejection during the total eclipse that you can identify visually, but maybe you might. I think only one has actually been seen visually uh, during a, an eclipse. Um, so, There's another instrument we have on a spacecraft that images the the, uh, the sun. They make running difference images of the sun. And uh, Alan, didn't this work better last night? It it, it was problematic. Okay. They started up when you didn't expect them. Yeah, maybe it's, uh, they go from here. It takes a moment for things to click in. We'll let that run a minute. I don't know. We had more luck last night, I think, showing these things. We had them all running. Um, what this would show this instrument is an ultraviolet instrument, but it's it's got the star field around it and it's taken it into account. And you can see the solar wind flowing outward. You're not gonna see solar wind flowing outward, but you, if you get the LASCO coronagraph data online, and you can see comets flowing inward, you might discover them. I think there's a citizen science and we've had a talk on this, with somebody at NRL a long time ago. This is the only one that didn't work last night, and all the others work. <laughs> right. Okay. I give up. Okay, here's a movie that works. Uh, there is a... Uh, satellite called Hanodi that has imaging spectrometers and it has a large white light telescope. And so this is an image, I think, actually probably close to white light. The very surface of the sun, you see these granules and you see stuff moving up. They emit a things called spicules. The spicules occur above the limb of the sun and they have about the same temperature as the chromosphere. The chromosphere is a region of the sun where the sun starts to get hot once you go above the surface. And that's where the H alpha flares and prominences occur. They occur in the chromosphere, which is about 7,000 kilometers thick. And so here you see it. You see the chromosphere is this, this band down here. And you see the prominence. And this is what happens with a prominence if you could watch it in, over a period of several days. When we see them visually with H alpha telescopes, we just see a snapshot of all this. But you can actually, there's a source, I'll tell you where to go to, where you can get movies of these things that have actually occurred. Maybe one that you've seen, like Dan Ward saw this spectacular 
these images at uh, the Night Owl Star Party. And uh, I, you can download a movie showing how these things formed and how they go away. Uh, you can see the chromosphere in an H alpha telescope. Um, if you try to, you go to higher power and you try to focus, and you'll find that it's difficult. There's like two foci. There's, there's one out here and one here. And you think, oh, these are crappy optics. But it's not. It's you're seeing the chromosphere. And you can watch this little thin band go all around, around the sun. So, okay, what about things that happen in the sun, the things that make space weather? Uh, how does the sun make flares and thermal mass ejections? One theory is something called magnetic reconnection. The magnetic field has energy stored in it. And if gas flows into field lines and pushes it inward, it will form essentially a singularity, like in the center of like a black hole, where these field lines pinch off and they go from a structure that's like, like, like this, it's like this, into two loop-like structures, one which goes down and one which goes up. The one which goes up is the mass ejection. The one that goes down produces a hot spot, and there's very energetic particles produced, and they flow down to the chromosphere, the base, and they evaporate gas up into the loop, which makes high density loops and makes a very bright solar flares. So here you have a solar flare in progress, and you get jets of material flowing in both directions from this magnetic reconnection process. What happens is the field goes into a different topology with lesser energy. And that energy is released and forms these jets of gas and hot, hot plasma. And down here, the gas will hit the chromosphere and gets evaporated up into it, forming a high density in the loop. The normal density in a corona is like 10 to the eight, nine electrons per cubic centimeter. But in the flare, it's like 10 to the 11, 11, 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12, and it's, it makes them bright. So, that's a sort of one idea of how flares get formed and mass ejections. The other is that flares get formed by waves that are emitted in the chromosphere, electromagnetic waves, and they essentially interact with the ions and the loops, and the energy gets reapportioned and makes a flare. But this is really theory. It's not known for 100%. Here's an example of a flare that we caught, a big flare, that forms like this flint there, this uh, flinky, and forms these magnetic loops from the top. So the flares are important because they emit the x-rays which energize our atmosphere. Produce, if you're out in space, you, you might want to have wet underwear on. So they, they can be, they're important because they affect space weather. They also can heat the solar atmosphere and expand it. And when that happens, all the debris, the orbits of all the debris changes. And the Air Force keeps track of where all the debris is out there. And sometimes the debris that will change, uh, and it, there'll be a certain threat that will hit our satellite, our satellites. Then we have to move the satellites a little bit to make sure they don't. Anyway, this, this is solar flares. They make the x-rays, and they cause a lot of interference with the ionosphere of the... Uh, of the Earth, which you may have guessed is why the Navy has some interest in, in the sun. The, the Navy really doesn't care about how the sun works or what you know, the physics of it. They care about what the sun is going to do to their satellites and orbits and the atmosphere and how it's going to affect communications. So here are x-rays produced by ghost satellites. You've probably all run into these things at one time or other. And the x-rays produce these enhancements in the x-ray flux. So when you get up to M, I, M, and X flares, you're talking about big flares. And this is what's actually happened over this interval of time with the sun. And you can see where the flares occur. And the flares occur in the active regions of the sun. So you can see flares in the pure H-alpha telescope that will produce a brightening. And that brightening will change in, in real time as you're sort of looking over, over, over several minutes. And if you go to the place that has the GOES data, you can actually see the X-ray data if you want. So here's some other just examples of what I've talked about. Here's a mass ejection that's occurred and the prominence gets blown out with it in the center of it. And you see this outer shell 
which is like uh, like a donut, so out of part of a donut. Um, and this goes out towards the earth. And these things, there's another example of these things, just being blown outward. Um, these things may contain high energy particles. They don't have to, but from the flares themselves, some of the particles get out. And they're the ones that are dangerous to communications at the earth. If a mass ejection has high energy particles that bangs into our magnetosphere and the polarities are opposite so that the particles can get into our magnetosphere, that's when you can have real problems with communications due to uh, essentially all our electric stuff on the earth getting actually destroyed by a huge eruption. So the Carrington uh, flare was I think the biggest one that ever occurred and that destroyed telegraph stations on the earth that were so huge. If we had something like that occurring today and we didn't take note of it or turn off our, our equipment, um, it could cause trillions of dollars of damage. It's, it's been estimated. So here again are just examples of these things of the plasma being blown outward. Things Probably we can't see anything like this. You might, if there's a big mass ejection, you might see a hint of it in the corona, or the outer corona. And here's what it looks like when the corona normally is going, and you have a lot of flares. This looks like just taken around corona maximum somewhere, and you see these mass ejections being blown out. And you, these are where the active regions are, where they're just stretched out in space. All right, so where can you see about all this? Uh, how many, you, you should look at solar monitor. That will give you some EUV images, extreme ultraviolet, but also gives you a white light image. And you can blow that up and see where the sunspots are any day you want. Uh, this thing, you can look at this. This is more involved if you want to look at this. But, and of course, you can, from Novak, you can get information about the sun from Novak. But the best place to see H alpha is to go to the H, go to your phone and just uh, Google H alpha gone and then click on the National Solar Observatory. And this will give you H alpha images. And it will give you, the, there are six images in gone made all over the world because they were gone and that's Global Oscillation Network Group. This is a group that studied the oscillations of the sun. The sun is like a ball, it's like a squishy ball and it oscillates. And you can find out about how uh, sound waves get transmitted deep into the sun through the core called helioseismology. And, but you need continuous observations. You can't, have, you can't have gaps in the observations. So there are six telescopes. There's, there's one in Chile, there's one in El Tid, Spain, and there's one in uh, Udapur, India, and there's one in Australia. And there's two in the United States, Big Bear and, and um, somewhere in Hawaii, or one of the Hawaii scopes. And so anytime, when you, when you click on these images, it'll give you the image within a few minutes of when you look, when you, when you go to look. And uh, you can, for example, at midnight or three in the morning, find out what's going on in the sun at, at the very moment by going to Australia and just looking at the image there. So um, I know some people, know this very well, but others don't. So if you don't have an H alpha telescope, this is where you want to go. Anyway, that's sort of all I had at the moment. So thank you for listening. Th thanks, George. Um, Sue Warden asked two questions on the chat and Pamela sort of answered them. From, from Googling it, but I'll, I'll relay yeah. the questions to you. Okay. Basically they were, uh, who, who created the sunspot numbers before we had systematic solar observing and especially uh, the Maunder minimum, how did they get sunspots around 16, 1600? The Chinese recorded a lot of sunspots, but um, they were, I don't know, Exactly. They were recorded in Germany, I think, by guys over there. There were people that recorded the sunspots. Pamela, you probably know better than I do. So, um, they kept records of it. I don't know how accurate those records really are. Um, but um, 
the fact that, you know, looking at sunspots, I don't know how they looked if they didn't have a telescope and they didn't have a filter and they must have gone blind. It's hard to see a sunspot with the naked eye. So I don't know how they did this recording, but I know that uh, way back, and of course, the Chinese are interested in anything to do with in the heavens because of all the uh, religious things they had connected with it. I forget who did this. Pamela, what's your answer? What did they say? There was a, a German guy, I think, that recorded a lot of these things. Yeah, there were there were several names that were mentioned that they mentioned that Chinese astronomers were noticed it back in the hundreds. But yeah, I don't yeah. know how they would have seen it. Obviously, they were very interested in it because they were, you know, back in those days, they were worried about anything that was imperfect. And they thought yeah. it was a sign of something. So they kept track That's of right. these things. And then once the telescope was invented, yeah. you know, they actually started looking at the sun and they noticed that yeah, there was, they didn't really was, notice the cycles until the mid 1800s. They started keeping track yeah. and counting. There was, there was Schwab, Schwab that had discovered that. And uh, then there was some German guy that kept many records of these things. Yeah, I had, I had heard a story that the Chinese were able to detect sunspot, large sunspot groups by looking at reflections. Yeah. From basically, I don't know if it was water or, or low reflectivity glass, but. Um, yeah, I've, re I've read similar things about uh, looking at reflections in, in pools of water, also at sunrise and sunset. And the, yeah. And uh, by the, uh, you know, Jefferson looked at sunspots using a, a smoked glass. So, yeah. and uh, but the and uh, the Galileo's daughter, there's some material in there about his early sunspot studies and and noting him and his assistants noting that the, they seem to be you know shifting, rotating across the sun, which got him in trouble with the church because the sun was supposed to be flawless and wasn't supposed to be moving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I must have been, uh, I don't know what that did to the eyes, but I'm sure uh, it wasn't very good. For some it wasn't reason. good. Well, they may, have, they may have figured out pinholes also. Yeah. To help. Um, Sue, uh, Sue asked about the slide with uh, the websites. The slides will be posted so you can get it online. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to copy it down now. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that in the reference pages. You can actually get the, when you go to Solar Monitor, uh, no, when you go to Gong and you get the HLP images, see, where do, where do I get them? Do I get them from, uh, one of these sites has the x-rays on it. I guess it's solar monitor. And you go to x-rays and you tap on that and that'll give you three days worth of x-rays. But there's another source. You can just write Google something like real-time x-ray data, goes x-ray data. And that'll give you real-time x-ray data right down to the time you're looking. Like, so if there's a flare, you can watch it in x-rays. And you, what's nice about uh, the goes, the gong stuff is you can download a movie just look, play with it. You have to play with it and download a movie. If you're looking at a prominence that's erupting, uh, you can see what happened the day before you look or the day after and so on. So you see the prominences in the eclipse, but that's, you want to see the corona and that's what you'll see during totality. You can see the prominences at any time. You don't have to have an eclipse. So be sure to look at the actual eclipse and not keep staring through your H alpha telescope during totality. Okay, anybody? Uh, I see Dan. Dan added something else that. Um, Dan to everyone. Galileo assistance used sun projection, which. Um, yeah, again, I'm just quoting what David Sobel had in yeah. Galileo's Daughter, that, that uh, uh, fairly soon Galileo's assistants figured that they could 
use a simple lens to project the sun image on paper or parchment, whatever, and, and they would trace the sunspots on that. So apparently they did fairly detailed studies. It was his assistant's board of Galileo. Yeah, makes sense. I'm, I'm going to get this thing right. <laughs> okay. Now I'm screen sharing. Okay. Yes. Can you see this? Uh, I can see iron 13. Static. Yes. Okay. Now it's just moving. The thing is moving. You're going up to higher ionization stages yes. and you're seeing what the active agent looks like. And it's going up to iron 16. Okay. So now try to play it again. Here's some helium-2, which is cold, up to a hotter line of magnesium-6 in the transition. Region. You see how the emission changes over the active region. Different temperature regions are all... The active region, the gas of the sun, plasma, in, in the corona has multi-temperatures. There's many different temperatures. It depends where you're looking. Can you see this? Yes, we're seeing the animation now. Yeah, okay. Now you're seeing a movie. Yeah. And we're seeing the the. Uh, it just you know, moved, just worked last night. I don't know why it didn't. Well, now it's working. So there it is. Iron fifteen is the hottest line shown, about two million degrees. Iron sixteen, and there everything is concentrated here, and also the emission is much more amorphous than it is in the lower temperatures, where it's very sharp and real tiny things that you can see when you go up into the corona being uh, spread out into this like painting this. this. Spread, spread out thing. I'm not sure we know why that, that has happened yet. I remember arguing about it way back in the Skylab workshop when the Skylab was launched and seeing this and the images made photographically. But anyway, that's the kind of thing you can do with an imaging spectrometer. You can actually photograph the sun. You can also photograph the Doppler shift of these spectral lines. And that means you can measure the motions going on towards and away from you. So we can see outflows and inflows, and we can also see turbulence. We can measure the width of the spectral line, which tells you something about the variation of temperatures inside of the plasma emitting it. There's a lot of turbulence, you can see that. So with these imaging spectrometers, you can get temperature, density, um, turbulence, you can get abundances of elements. You can get the whole nine yards. That's what spectrometers do throughout astrophysics. That's why they're they're really important. And that's what the web's trying to do in the infrared now. George, on this image, where how how big is the solar disk? How big? Yeah, on this picture, are we seeing a detail? Oh, you're just seeing a small active region, like you know one of those bright region. regions. Okay. This is just a small active region on the disk. Um, I think I took this image in December. Um, you know, it's, you said, so this, this image as I showed, let me see, since we seem to be able to move around here now. Um, well, It's like one of these regions, uh, one of these regions. Here, let me get the pointer, yeah, laser pointer. It's like one of these regions. So what, what the imaging spectrometer does is it makes a spectrum over and it makes a spectrum across a slit, which is, it's uh, a stigmatic slit, meaning it has resolution along the slit. And then you make, then you have a stepper motor which steps the sun. It moves the spectrometer to point at different regions of the active region all the way across. And then what you can do is you can integrate over all the wavelengths at each, at each spectrum and you stack them and you get an image. So an imaging spectrometer, it, makes, it can make an image of this active region, but it can also give you all the spectroscopy from it, which is not what you can get from the kind of instrument that made this image or this image. Note how the structures at 100,000 degrees are tiny and small all over. And up here in a corona, they're amorphous, like I was showing at that movie. 
Let me see. What else? What other movie didn't play? Who's played? Pull this. Uh, I wonder. No, we're still not going to get this one to play. There are comets rushing into the, to the sun here. <laughs> This is a running difference movie, but what you do is you subtract, you, you, you observe the sun on two different days and you subtract one day from the, the, the current day. And so where the sun was uh, dark, where the sun was bright here is moved out to here and you can see the, the movement going outward. And then these comets rush in, but I can't make this movie play somehow. Well, that's playing. Everything seems to be playing now, as much, as much as I can get playing. Okay. Well, thanks again, George. I think um, be, before we go, uh, there's one topic I want to bring up, and that is, um, what are we going to do about hands-on practice? Practice, and and I want to hear people's opinions of what should be done, when, and what kind of a location. Of course, the only requirement is, and it's not even really a requirement, that we have decent access to the sun um, so that people can, can point their telescopes and do their full setup and set up shade where they want shade. Uh, so to get something at roughly the elevation of the sun during the eclipse, of course, that depends a little bit on where you'll be, but it's in the range probably around 45 to 60 degrees for most people. Um, so as long as we have a clear shot of the sky uh, at that range, and it doesn't matter about whether we're in the city or in the country, uh, the one, suggest one suggestion was to do it along with an observing event but looking at the calendar, I think the next appropriate event would not be until Crockett late in July. And um, that might be uncomfortably hot for a daytime project. So uh, what do people want to do? And do people want to do that instead of a, uh, uh, in, instead of a July evening virtual meeting? The, uh... One option is the uh, Analyma Society, uh, Cal, Powell will be, Cal Powell will be teaching his course, The Sun, on Saturday, July 8th. That's from 11 to, I think, 1230. And, uh, you know, the classroom there is nice. It's air conditioned, nice field outside it. Uh, they would be thrilled if some of us came and set up our scopes after Cal's class is over. You know, people come out and look at the scopes. It, you know, July 8th is going to be hot, but but the building is air conditioned, so there's an opportunity to cool down. Yeah. Of course, that's, that's fairly far out, July 8th, but it's an option. Well, it's a good alternative. Um, uh, following the, the schedule, which we tried to maintain, the next time for this meeting would be, for this session, would be July 4th. And of course, that's not going to happen. So July 8th might be a good idea. And I know you had mentioned that before, Dan, and I'm sorry I forgot that. Um, because it's, it's not on, on my calendar or the club calendar. Yeah, Cal does a good class. I've attended it before, but it's it's through Fairfax County, so you have to pay $8 to attend his class. You know. Yeah, I was saying we can't, we can't invite ourselves to his class, but yeah, we can be hanging up for I guess we. I guess we can be hanging around, especially. Yeah, now. they they would, uh, Cal and uh, Jeff Koresh and uh, Alan Figgett would be happy if, for some of us to show up and just set up outside the classroom. Yeah, and Great Falls is probably a, a, a not really inconvenient place to go. And um, I mean, certainly people will be able to catch lunch around there if they need to someplace. Um, well, should... Should we plan on that? Uh, do people have objections, alternative suggestions? It doesn't necessarily have to be the only time we do it, but um, that might be a place to do a first attempt 
Another question is, is when is the, uh, the astronomy on the mall event? That's the 24th of June. 24th of June. Yeah. But I, I, I think logistics of that would be awkward because yeah. I haven't been to it, but people say the drop off and pick up is, is awkward. You can't, you yeah. can't be near your car. And, um, I think, I think, uh, Analemma makes more sense at the, at the park. Um, yeah, Alan, Richard, that would be fine. Can you hear me, Richard? Uh, Alan? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, good. Um, Analemma would be fine, or we just pick a school, school will be out. Some, some school at two o'clock or one o'clock or 12 o'clock in the parking lot, and, and people that want to come, come and set up and maybe an alternative date somewhere, maybe in Fairfax County, but, uh, I'd be willing to go to the Analemma uh, meeting uh, as a, as a option, but this is getting me energized. I need a new filter. My other one had holes in it from 2017. I threw it away. Yeah, um, and 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 I agree, Richard. Uh, I, when I started looking around, I realized all the places that don't let us in at night doesn't matter. We could go to those places uh, for the, for this kind of a setup, but. Um, why don't we plan on aiming for uh, Analemma on the 8th and we'll let um, Cal know that he may have some visitors in the parking lot. And then we'll plan on doing it again sometime later, um, someplace probably further south and west, uh, maybe a Fairfax County Park or a Loudoun Park there's no need to go as far out as Sky Meadows or even to go out as far as Crockett. The only advantage of Crockett is if you're setting up anyway, yep. but you wouldn't be setting up the same kind of equipment. So it may not be as relevant. Okay, Alan, I've got one other thing. Um, the library where I gave a talk in 2017 um, wants me to, to give a couple of talks starting in January of next year. So the interest is, is up. The libraries are getting the uh, glasses again, the observing glasses, and they give them out at the lectures and as an incentive for people to come to the library. The other thing is in the, uh, the March issue of Astronomy Magazine, they had the 2024 uh, equips several articles and the one that says simulate totality. Thank you. The, the uh, uh, Eclipse2024.org has thousands of cities around the world where they've computed uh, Eclipse information for 2024. And they have several thousand where on, um, on YouTube where they have actually an animation. And if you see at the bottom of this page, the animation looks like that. And, it, and I looked up Alexandria because it was in the A's it was easier to find, uh, but you can see that there's a time for each of these uh, events that are about 13 different ones that uh, go with your city or your locale. So you can actually have some pretty good precise information depending on where you're going to be or uh, where people are going to be to know, you know, as the, as the eclipse progresses, what to expect, yeah, actually down to the minute. So yeah, you can... I've got the reference already on my on my uh, on my references page. It's been there Good. for a while. Good. I'm not sure it's to them, but um, uh, one of the French amateurs, uh, Javier, whose last name I forget, um, who's who's big on um, modeling and simulation and predictions. Um, I think he's one of two people who have generated these simulations. And I think um, I think they're not pre-computed. They're computed on the fly. So you put in any location uh, on or off the line and actually on or off the central line. And it will show you the time series of what the entire eclipse will look like. Yep. Uh, reference to the horizon for the entire period from first contact to fourth contact. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's amazing what they've done um, since the last time through. But yeah, you can get a full idea 
uh, and you can get yourself oriented with respect to the motion of the sun against the horizon and the orientation of uh, the motion of the moon with respect to the sun. Because when you actually look at it, the, uh, the moon sort of appears to be backtracking yep. because the sun, is appear the sun is moving towards the west, but the apparent shape of the moon is moving toward the east across the face of the sun because the moon is moving a little bit slower than the sun in the sense of the rotation, your, your experience. So yeah, that's, that's uh, a good sight. Uh, the other thing in preparation for a run through is people should download and experiment with the various uh, Eclipse uh, programming software, Eclipse Orchestrator and Maestro, and there are a couple of others uh, because it seems to me it only makes sense, and we heard this from Jeff Ball and others, uh, to get your exposures pre-planned yep. and not, not be pushing buttons if you have any kind of a camera which can be pre-programmed. Um, I, I will go to, um, I was unsure if I'd have time. I, I, if we can go until nine, I'll, I'll do this one thing on my, um, from my slide deck. Alan, while well, you're looking for your deck, I, I wanna mention that there is a, uh, there's also a summer solstice celebration at Analemma on uh, Monday, June the 19th. That's from 12 to two. That's really not Analemma, it's the Fairfax County Parks. Uh, probably gonna be a zillion kids there, but that, that might be an interesting place to set up. So that's, yep. uh, if you summer solstice celebration at Analemma on uh, Monday, July, June 19th from 12 to 2. Yeah, I think I'd, uh, I'd, I'd prefer the July because I'm, I'm not sure people's setups will be all that photogenic. You know, maybe people who are, uh, who are interested in the sun would like to see the photographic setups. But if we can't show them real time and probably could show them sunspots or something like that. But um, it's, it's not going to be as kid friendly. Yeah. Especially if they're grown up swearing at the lack of cables, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not, not appropriate for under uh, preteens. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm sharing a couple of slides that I, I did that were sort of in anticipation of, of uh, George's. Um, he talked about the mechanisms. This is a, a plot of, of the various contributions to the solar corona. Um, and, and this is a, a logarithmic scale this way. So every, every number is a factor of 10, which means that two numbers being a factor of 100 is five magnitudes. I don't know if you, you know that bit of trivia, but five magnitudes is exactly a factor of 100 in brightness. So going from the disk of the sun up here, um, the corona is down by a factor of 100, 10,000, a million, where you start to get the prominences in the chromosphere. And parenthetically, if you put a, a typical solar filter on your optical sensor, it's about an ND6. So the, the neutral density filter is taking the brightness of the uneclipsed sun down to the brightness of the inside of the corona and the prominences, which is convenient because it means at the end of, uh, at the, end of the partial phase, uh, at the beginning of totality, if you take off the filter, then your exposure time is staying just about the same to get the prominences. It's that factor of a million, which you need. Now, some neutral density filters are only uh, 100,000, but something around that ballpark. But then from this brightness level, uh, there are various contributions and George talked about them. Historically, they're called the K corona, the F corona, the E corona, there are some others, um, depending on, on whether it's scattered light or electrons or, or, or other phenomena that bring things down. Um, but overall, there's a difference 
of about 2000 to one between the brightness of the inner corona and the brightness of the sky during total eclipse. And what that means is that, uh, here's a little bit more specific, less cartoonish. You're going, same units here, you're going from one millionth of the brightness of the solar disk down to a billionth of the brightness at the eclipse sky. Now, that's saying that the corona is about equal to the background sky at, uh, at one one thousandth of the inner corona. Now, nothing stops you from seeing the corona even when it's dimmer than the background sky. So down here, you're saying the corona is 10% brighter. And astrophotographers do that typically all the time. So you're really going by a factor of about 10,000 to one. And that leads to one of the phenomena that people talk about. There's no wrong exposure during, almost no wrong exposure during totality because almost anything you set will get some part of the sun. Uh, and what the other thing that's happening is as you go from the inner corona, the prominences, you've got a disc that's just half a degree. Now you're seeing further and further out. So you might be seeing as far as four degrees away from the sun. And this is equatorial uh, in different times of the solar cycle. The equator is either brighter or the same as the pole. So uh, this chart will be there too, but roughly if you've got an F11 system at ISO 400 taking pictures, your range of exposures can go anywhere from a thousandth of a second to one second. And these are the numbers that, that Fred Espinak uh, publishes as typical. And if you have a different F ratio and you have a different ISO setting, you can scale these exposure times. Um, your considerations will be what kind of amount do you have? What focal length? Uh, do you want to do a one second exposure? Do you have to keep it shorter? Uh, don't you care? And how many times you're going to go through it? Stacking still works. Uh, There's some other techniques that work. But um, I just wanted to summarize in the context of what George was talking about of the extended corona. Um, just put some numbers on the amazing dynamic range from the inside to the outside. And by the way, that leads to another consideration, which is your optics had better be, had better be clean because uh, this is like having the full moon in the field of view comparatively uh, and trying to take, take deep fuzzies, faint fuzzies. The inner corona will scatter light in your telescope and make it difficult to get good quality outer corona unless your optics is clean. Uh, the typical problems you have with a mix of bright and dark objects. So um, that's all I had. I think, I think there were good suggestions on the hands-on practice. Um, I don't know um, if there are any other suggestions or discussion topics this is, um, these are some ideas that have been mentioned. Uh, Dan Ward also recently mentioned to me a, a resource, somebody who might talk about uh, tripods and mount considerations for travel. Uh, if, you're, if you're considering upgrading, I think um, my experience was to make sure you get a decent lightweight tri tripod, not take something that might shake a lot. Um, as I mentioned with, in conjunction with the, um, the hands-on practice, people should, uh, should be practicing with uh, automation software. And that's something that you can do on your own, but uh, uh, practice, practice, practice before the eclipse happens. Even getting it set up properly. If you do the automation correctly, it's gonna be hands-on during totality, but you don't wanna be running around trying to figure out where your batteries are at uh, totality minus 20 seconds. Uh, you have to make sure you've got all your power supplies running correctly. 
and then um, we might have a discussion sometime about what arrangements people have made already, because I assume that has been maturing, at least in people's minds, if not in their actions. So um, I'm always open to suggestions for more things we could do, different things. Uh, it sounds like we'll get back together again, not in July, but in August online and continue with the monthly sessions then as, uh, and maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the annular. I don't know what more there is really to say about it. Um, maybe we'll do the, uh, the discussion of people's preparations in time for the annular so people have an idea where where their colleagues from Novak will be headed to, to see that if they are heading out. So that's all I've got. Anybody else have any comments? Open the floor. One question, Richard uh, mentioned earlier that he was looking uh, to replace his filter. Alan, do you still have a, a, some filter material that you might be uh, selling at some point? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> one, one more thing to get rid of. Um, it's, it's, uh, the price has gone up because it's now aged quality uh, <laughs> uh, vintage vintage uh it was even i i got it for the transit of venus actually so when was that 2010 something so it has a patina now is that what you're telling us no actually it, it does prove <laughs> that um <laughs> some of it got damaged we had a flood in the basement but uh most of it did not get damaged so it's it's uh it's good and this is the um shoot who's the manufacturer I'm making a note that Alan is selling uh, hydrogen oxygen filters now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they they uh, they cut down the attenuate they attenuate the uh, H alpha uh, suitably. Now I've got um, I think uh, it's I've got the eight inch roll, and um, I don't know like it, it's like ten dollars per square or something like that. It's a third or a quarter of what the uh, what the online places do. And the thing I was going to say, I have checked it. Um, these have not developed any pinholes. I don't know any reason why they would develop pinholes, but people have talked about um, the potential of aging. But this is the, um, uh, Dan, you did the comparison of, of multiple films. I think this is the kind that gives you yellowish, not white. Um, but yeah, I've checked it out and I, I put it on my Celestron 8 and uh, works perfectly fine. So yeah, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll have information certainly in time for the annular. Um, um, yeah, of how people can get more of the sheet material. Thanks for reminding me. Any other comments, suggestions before we cut it off? Um, uh, just one random thing, Alan. Um a lot of people are using their iPhone and using iPhone for the Eclipse is possible. And I've, I've looked up some articles. I'm not an expert on it, but most everybody, uh, you know, people from this group are going to, going to have an astrophotography uh, set up probably with them. But anyway, for, for people that just want to have their camera out, there are a number of articles. I just started to read some of them. I'm not uh, an expert on, on this by any means, but if there's someone else who, who is planning to do that or has experienced using the iPhone camera. It, it's an interesting thing for me. I'm reading up on it. And if we could find some, some guru who would like to, uh, you know, enlighten us, I think I would enjoy that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I would think that people would be looking for an app that allows them to control the exposure. You don't want to be entirely on auto exposure during the eclipse because it'll just it'll just make some estimate of medium. Uh, and of course, there's a big difference if you're trying to do it by putting the iPhone on a telescope or just taking a, a scenic of um, of the surroundings. I think I think Jeff Ball showed. He had set up his his uh, his iPhone in in um, slow not slow motion in um, stop action, 
just to keep track of the overall brightness. Yep. And um, and it sort of works for that. But if you try to take a picture of the eclipse itself, the eclipse sun, I would think the auto exposure would be fooled and you'd want to override it in, in a way I, I don't understand. Yeah, there are a number of articles out, Alan. Uh, I just read some. Anybody else that's interested, just Google it and you, you, you can just go through the list and find something you're interested in and just read up on it. Do you have a particular article that you can recommend? Because I, I just Googled it a couple of days ago and I read the first two or three articles <laughs> and they seem to be interested and then I moved on. Well, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of task you, if, if you would, look at them and see which ones pass a sanity check for, you know, from the point of view of an astronomer. If yep. what they're saying makes sense, because I would think there'd be a lot of popular photography type magazines that say either slap a filter on the front and take a picture of the partial or just point it at the sun and see what happens. Um, and, and like I said, I would expect you'd want to force a longer exposure or, or you'd like to force uh, bracketing that's more extensive than normal to capture the range of brightnesses someplace in there. And yeah, what, let me look around and, and yeah. I'll send you um, some articles that I find that, that look uh, in, halfway interesting. Right, and I'd appreciate that. Okay. I would add that we can, we can talk about it next time we get together online or, okay. um, you know, certainly if, if there's a, uh, if there's an article that, that really looks like it gives useful information, I'll add it to the list of references. As I said, that's growing on the, um, uh, it's not on a website, on the files that I reference each time. There's a list of references with some comments about what they're good for and what they're bad for. And uh, not just random website, yeah. but yeah. things I've looked at. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, it's nine o'clock. Uh, I think it's time to, to call it quits unless somebody else has a comment. Um, I'll do a quick look if there's anything else in chat. Um, I don't see anything. I think this has worked pretty well tonight. Thanks again to George for uh, filling us in with all the details and providing animations, which we don't often see in, uh, in astronomy. Most of our things go very slowly on the order of thousands of years, uh, and his at least go in minutes. So um, I'll send out notices when, when we have the stuff posted from this meeting, and um, we'll aim for the uh, Fairfax County on July 8th, and follow that up with uh, another online meeting at the beginning of August around, uh, around full moon. Um, hopefully not to interfere with any real observing of, of the dark sky. And uh, we'll see you then. Hopefully see you on, uh, on the 8th. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Alan. Good night. Thanks right, again, good night, George. Uh, Great session.